Um, well, I'll get started now. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we are beyond excited and extremely privileged to have, um, you know, one of my favorite people and most amazing, generous collaborators ever, um, Gunther Fink, who is head of household economics and health systems research at the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute. Um, thank you for making time, even though this is the evening in <laughs> Uh, Basel to talk about this um, really, really interesting project, which is the collaboration with the World Bank. So, Gunther, I'll let you take it away. We we try to end at least, you know, quarter of-ish for questions, but you can let people know how you want to handle questions throughout the talk. So, go for it. Yeah, thank you, Maggie, and thank you all for joining. It's a very special moment. I, I, I wish I was there in person. I guess that's the only thing that's sad about it. It would be nice to be in a 12th floor and see you all and uh, give everybody a hug, I guess, but uh, nice to see you virtually. And yeah, I have very many, many fond memories of many excellent THP seminars. So it's uh, great to be part of it on the, on the other side. So let me uh, get started. And uh, yeah, to your question about questions, I think as always, you should interrupt at any time, like the more questions there are, the, the better. And I will, adjust my pace <laughs> according to the number of questions I will be getting. So let me try to share this again. Can you see my just one slide or you see the preview? Just one slide, perfect. Great, uh, so today I'll talk about uh, incentivized vignettes to improve quality of care. Uh, this is a project that we conducted in the Congo DRC. This is joint work with colleagues uh, Yuri Fritsche and Claude Sese, who are both based uh, in DRC, including for the World Bank and Claude working for the Ministry of Public Health, and Gil Shapira, who is a friend and colleague at the World Bank. Um, just a brief overview. I'll give a little bit of background. I'll try to be brief, talk about the objectives, a little bit of the settings, and then hopefully we'll have quite a bit of time to go over results and discussion. We are still, yeah, I would say struggling a bit on how to view the overall results, whether it was a success or not. And I'm curious to hear your uh, thoughts and feedback on that. Good, I think background uh, for this crowd, I will keep super short. You all know that under five mortality is uh, still high. Uh, we have made lots of progress, but still more than 5 million kids are dying. And I think lots of people in this department have focused on quality of care. And we know that there are large gaps and lots of efforts to improve quality, but the best ways are not quite clear. The objective here uh, was to see whether knowledge assessments, and there are many of many knowledge assessments, but knowledge assessments that have financial incentives tied to them can improve quality of care and ultimately also health outcomes. And to address this objective, we conducted a randomized control trial within a large World Bank project that was conducted in Congo and DRC. I assume everybody sees the slides and understands me <laughs> clearly. How do I speak up now before I'm halfway through? Good. Okay, I think you also all know where Congo DRC is. I think what some people forget is just how huge uh, this country is. It's um, larger than Spain, France, Germany, Sweden, Norway combined. It's also, um, my, I think it's by four times California or two times Alaska. So it's really uh, vast in terms of its size. It's still lagging, uh, even most of the other African countries in terms of outcomes. We are now at roughly 80 per thousand uh, under five mortality, an HDR rank of 179 out of 190, so very much at the bottom, also high rates of stunting and anemia. Uh, what we were working with here is a large project that was called Cochet du Développement du Système de Santé, which essentially is just a health system strengthening project that the World Bank has been running since 2015. Congo DRC is one of the focal countries of the World Bank, but it's poor and large and definitely has lots of needs uh, in terms of health system investment. Uh, as many systems, the Congo kind of divides the country into first regions and then within regions, there are health zones and within health zones, uh, there are health areas. So think of a health area as roughly one primary healthcare facility covering about 10,000 people. And then a health zone covers about 10 of those health areas and all of those are nested in the region. So 
this project covers about 165 health zones, which yeah is a very large area, which I'll talk more about in a second. The project tried to do lots of institutional, financial, and technical support, and of course also to prove governance and general health systems resilience, I guess, as the, as the project would claim. The budget, which I think is quite interesting, was $3.8 per capita year, which might seem ridiculously low for uh, a place like the US, but in the Congo, actually, that is quite substantial. Like, bear in mind that we're talking about a population of like more than 100 million, so that there would be about 400 million budget just to run this project if you would run it for the full country. Um, as I mentioned already, uh, this PDSS project uh, was run in the regions that you can see here in this slide. So not even half the country, but still a huge uh, chunk. So we estimate about 30 million population in the areas where we work. Uh, and uh, what happened here was at the core of this whole program was a PBF project. I think many of you have heard of these results-based or performance-based financing contracts that essentially pay facilities based on a number of indicators that are agreed on at the beginning of the project. And then usually there's a quality bonus. And as in many other projects, there was a formal evaluation, which was nice. So the PBF component was randomly assigned at the health zone level. And for each health zone, they matched like the, they picked like a matching health zone that just got like a roughly the same amount in as a cash transfer. So no conditions attached. You just get the same amount of money. And then there was an evaluation, which I will not talk about much today. Um, here is just the usual PBF formula. I'm guessing many of you have also seen this. So this summation is just you, uh, you, you specify some services that you would like to incentivize. So these are things like outpatient, surgery, referral, vaccination, and you just give a price tag to it. So for each outpatient, I give you a dollar. For each surgery, I give you $3 and so on. So you agree on these. And then you also do a quality score. And this, this I think, was even done in the first studies in Rwanda. So you essentially say, like, I, I give you a proportional raise, essentially, based on some qualitative, qualitative indicators. Yeah, so the maximum bonus here um, was for was 25% for health centers. Yeah, so the Y here is 25% for the hospitals. They had a different quality bonus, but we don't work with the hospitals in our project, so I will ignore that for the rest of the talk. And sorry, the bonus goes to like the whole facility or? Yes, to... sorry, yes, okay. yeah, so that's important to clarify. So the bonus then, like, so do the math here and like, get a bonus, like let's say a small facility gets $2,000 or something like that. And then the, the bank tells the facility that they have to spend roughly half of that for facility improvements. So they can buy supplies, they can paint the walls, they can, whatever they think is a useful investment and the other half goes to staff bonuses. So it's meant to motivate the staff, but it's also meant to improve the structural quality. I don't think that 50-50 is exactly in force, but they essentially ask facilities to have some kind of business plan on how they will spend the money and then more or less, I think facilities stick with that. How, how does it compare to the budget for the facility? I will give you more on that in a second, but roughly speaking, I think it was between 40 and 50% of the annual budget they had before, before the project was launched. So it was big, like this was a big cash inflow for those facilities, even though we're talking about very low levels. Those are not, not rich facilities. Hi, Michael, nice to see you. Uh, yeah, I'll skip the list. Uh, what we're going to focus on here is the vignette intervention. So what we built into this whole system that the bank set up uh, was uh, this training component essentially on how to uh, follow clinical procedures that are recommended by the IMCI guidelines. I think all of you also know what IMCI stands for, so Integrated Management Care of Illness or Child Illness, sorry. And um, they essentially, they being the World Bank, together with the Ministry of Health, developed 12 vignettes. And these vignettes essentially were meant to practice how you kind of um, check in and follow all the steps of diagnosis and treatments that are recommended by IMCI. So these were 12 cases that were done in an interactive way. And they were not just meant like, what do you do? Uh, maybe I, I 
I'll give you an example later, but the, the idea was that of these vignettes was to be interactive. So not the typical, like, you know what you do if there's a child with fever and cough, and then you give an answer, but it was more like, okay, I'm here with my child who's three years old and is coughing. What do you ask? And then you ask, okay, like, well, how long has the child been coughing? And then uh, my child has been coughing for five days. Like, uh, how high is the fever? 38. Like, well, how, what's the weight of the child? So you are meant to ask all the questions for a proper diagnosis and the assessor or the person who tests you will give you the correct information. And then you get a score based on the information that you collected. So did you all the, did you collect all the information that is needed for a correct diagnosis? You get a score for whether or not the diagnosis was correct, and you get a score for whether you gave the right drugs or referral, like where essentially you get you made the correct treatment decision. Yeah, so it's like a three-part scoring in then kind of like interactive game. So you will say, like, you can ask for any like nonsensical test, whatever you want. The assessor will try to give you the answer. Like you can um, require, like ask for a malaria test and anemia test. There's a long sheet essentially of information that you can provide. And you have to try to get the diagnosis right in this, I would say, almost like an assessment game. So what uh, we did essentially have these vignettes. And then every quarter, because the facilities get quarterly payments, we would go to the facility. We would see which providers were on staff, randomly select one for the assessment. And then they had to go through the assessment, get the score. And that score then entered into the payment function. So specifically, I told you before, so there was the quantitative bonus, which was fixed for all facilities. And then there was the quality bonus, which we partially substituted with our vignette assessment. So there was another quality list, which was more based on facility quality and completeness of, of logs and other things that the bank wanted. And the other 50% of this bonus now was replaced in our treatment group by the score that those providers got on their vignette assessment. Does it make sense? So we came every quarter, randomly pick one, run this game slash test with them, and then um, enter the score the system, and the score directly determines the bonus that the entire facility gets. So if you ask, like, does it affect their own bonus? Well, only indirectly through the facility bonus, and uh, depending on how that's distributed. And that, by the way, is also not clearly regulated. Like the bank did not. Uh, have a clear split in terms of the bonuses and there was every facility had their own negotiation essentially saying okay well you sit down and you decide how you split that but from the ones that i personally talked to it was quite hierarchical usually like the lead nurse or lead doctor would get almost half of the bonus and then the lower ranks would usually get a very small share so not necessarily fair distribution but apparently that was what they agreed on anyway so the treatment essentially is 50 percent standard bonus 50 percent with this vignette checklist and the control is just 100 percent standard quality checklist no provider interactions in terms of imci vignettes what did the providers know about the vignettes in advance yeah so actually that was one of the things that we discussed a lot but the bank was very nervous about us being mean or unfair so they knew everything so essentially we gave okay. them like the vignettes the 12 vignettes with the solution pretty much uh, at the beginning of the project so they could study them they could look at them and they should have, I mean, if they had taken it very seriously, they should have almost always received the perfect score. But of course, that didn't happen in practice. And I'll say a little bit more about that. Like fundamentally, of course, in the beginning, they didn't take the assessment seriously. They didn't quite understand <laughs> what we were up to. But over time, they learned, as I will show you. But there is also an, a remarkable amount of staff turnover. I was really shocked, like how much staff turnover we saw just between like baseline and end line. And that, of course, complicated things a bit in terms of the vignettes, because some guys came in and they were completely new to this and then not obviously did not do so well in, in some cases. So here is just like one little thing, like I think most of one little example. So this is, I for those of you who know French, I'll let you read yourself, but roughly saying, yeah, good morning, doctor. I'm I'm I am the mother. I'm here with my son who is one year old. His name is uh, Michel, and he has diarrhea. Then you have to go through. So, how long has the child had diarrhea? Is there blood in the in the stool, and so on? So you go through the list, and then there is a score you get at the end. So, why do did we do this? Why do we think it works? Like, well, we thought that there is like too much kind of just kind of traditional teaching where like the Ministry of Health has this one day workshop when you have four hours of slides where you present on the importance of IMCI, but there's not enough of applied training. So the idea of the 
vignettes was to actually go through the application of these guidelines that let's talk about the specific kid and let's show me what you do and show me how you diagnose and show me how you do these tests and then I'll give you feedback. So that was also one part that I liked at the end of each assessment. They said like, well, you know, this is good, but you should have also checked the respiratory rate or you should have also asked about measles, like you should have also checked the neck, like you should have looked at the ears and like these kind of things. So this kind of like encouraging uh, learning experience was meant to uh, really help people think about the guidelines and to apply them in practice. And of course, to make sure that people take them seriously, we attach the financial benefits. Benefits were not directly attached to the person, as I said, but through the facility to the person. So to Michael's question, so how big was this incentive? So um, in the project overall, the health centers on average reached $2,000 per quarter or about $8,000 per year's quantitative bonus. So if you did really well, you could get an average of like $500 per quarter or $2,000 per year. So not massive, but given local salary levels, that those were non-trivial bonuses. The incentive structure, though, was quite weird, and I never figured out who came up with the idea, because what the World Bank had decided, if you score less than 50% on the quality score, you get no quality bonus at all. So essentially, the quality bonus will be set to zero, and then it linearly increases between 50% and 100% up to a maximum of 25%. Don't ask me why. I mean, they, I guess it was meant to enforce minimum standards, but if you think of the marginal return to learning on health exam, it's super high if you blow 50, and then like once you're over 50, it becomes quite small. Like you can just like an additional 10% of score essentially gives you maybe $20 or something like that for the facility in quarter. So it gets quite marginal effect once you get over that minimum threshold. Good. Um, how did we randomize? Well, the PDF was randomized through public procedures, but uh, that was not our problem. Our experiment was restricted to facilities that were in the PBF arm. So for the larger evaluation, there was a PBF arm and a control arm. We just worked the PBF arm because we needed the contract to be set up with all these facilities. So we worked with all PBF facilities and just randomly selected by a random number draw 50% for the additional vignette intervention. Good. Um, yeah, here is what we did in practice. So this uh, experiment was restricted to Bandundu uh, province, former Bandundu. Now it's divided into three sub provinces. Um, you can see the 23 PBF health zones. So the reason why there are some empty cells in between is that these were PBF control zones. So we just work in the PBF health zones. And we had 150 health centers in total in our experiment. And we did 50-50 random allocation. Um, yeah, so the unit of randomization was the health center. Uh, we had 117, we lost two uh, in the follow-up one because it was reassigned to another district that was not part of the project, so we couldn't do it. And the other one, for safety reasons, we were not allowed to send the team back in at end line, but I think that's okay overall. We did lots of data collection. I think the um, good thing was the bank for all these PF, PBF projects has set up this crazy machinery of data collection, which involves health center assessments that are very detailed, including direct observations of uh, under five care, exit interviews, direct observation of family planning, also exit interviews, and then household surveys around the facilities that are in these samples. We also have the admin data for the payments, like we know which facility got how much in each quarter from 2016 onwards, and then of course we also have the data on the vignettes. So every time a vignette assessment was done, the assessor entered that in an online system and we can see which provider got what score or what vignette in, in each round. All clear so far on the experiment before I dive into results? Okay, cool. So the first thing I want to show you was implementation. So as you can imagine, we were pretty, <laughs> pretty far away from some of these implementation activities as uh, they were in the middle of Bandundu run by consultants hired by the World Bank. So kind of three levels of control away, I would say. Um, but the PBF, I would say they reached them. So this is based at N9. We asked providers, have you, are you aware that there's PBF in the facility? And 98% said, yes, I know what PBF is. I know we're getting paid for them. So 
I think that part is good. And then we ask them, like, are you aware of this vignette intervention that we are running vignettes and you know how they work? And that was not this perfect. So we have about 80% uh, saying that heard, they heard of the vignettes. And we also discovered that the vignettes had been run in some facilities that were not supposed to get them. I think it was three. So overall, a facility level compliance was about 90%. Like the team mostly did what they were supposed to do, but there was definitely some deviation. And then there was this uh, slightly more unexpected drop. Uh, that's then the switch from have you heard about this vignette program in general versus have you been personally exposed? So people said, yeah, sure, I know how this works. Like you guys come, like do this assessment. And then we asked, like, have you ever been? invited to study for these in, in um, asked to study for these assessments or have you actually studied and that's only about 25 percent so in terms of provider reports of direct exposure not so much studying that we asked them like you know somebody from your colleagues who got tested in, in depth so only 40 percent like I was expecting that to be higher but I guess not everybody um, talks to everybody in some of these facilities had quite a few staff members and only about I think 23 percent said that personally got tested and about 25% said that the test results affected their bonuses. So I would say compliance in terms of program reach overall was quite good, but personal exposure was not as strong as we were, were hoping for. And I think part of that is, yeah, often relatively large staff members that go in and out. Like we're not talking about lots of doctors. I'll say more about it in a second, but we're talking about Lots of people who have these part-time jobs that they come and go, and I think there's an amazing amount of turnover uh, in these facilities that makes it hard to train like one specific providers because they keep switching them out. Um, so then the first thing we look at is financial implications for the facility, and here you see some like quarterly estimates comparison of treatment and control. There's like some weird bump. So we started the vignettes in the third quarter of 2018. There's some weird bump in the average quality score just before in the treatment group, and we're not quite sure if that's just some random noise or they were getting ready, or I, I, I'm not sure what, what this is. Like, it's not significant, but it's, it's a bit of an outlier. But by and large, I, I don't think there's any evidence that it changed the average financial flow to facilities. So I think on average, these quality scores were very similar to the quality scores that we're just focusing on structure. So the financial implications for the facilities are quite small. We then look at providers. And here I must say I was yeah, quite wrong. <laughs> I was nervous when the bank presented this assessment and the, these guys from the ministry coming in and playing this kind of almost like a school-based game where I tell you how to diagnose and we did a bit of piloting in Kinshasa with a doctor and the doctor was super annoyed by the test like why do you question me and like of course I know how to diagnose and I thought we would get lots of pushback people wouldn't like to be assessed and judged but um, we don't see any of that like I think we see like nothing on motivation so how on a scale from zero to ten how much are you motivated to your job and there is nothing there and then for satisfaction with salary and uh, feedback and support, uh, there is actually like a 0 0.3 standard deviation improvement, which I did not anticipate. I thought this would, would create friction and like being annoyed, but um, this kind of training and at least in the self reports and maybe, you know, it, I always find it hard when you come as a project and then ask like, uh, how did you feel about these uh, things? They were surprisingly positive like yeah it helped me think about the guidelines and i liked them and they were friendly and i thought they were useful so the providers seem to have liked these assessments more than i thought and apparently there were like kind of financial repercussions were rare enough to really make them worry about that so that's good <laughs> the first part was good um then we look at the performance on the vignettes so just in case you wonder whether they did better over time. There is very strong evidence for that. So here you can see the first quarter, <laughs> the average score in assessment was only 20, but then it goes up quite quickly. Like within one year, we are over the magic 50 bar, which was really the main target to get like uh, some non-zero quality bonus. And you can see that like in all vignettes pretty much. So you see some kind of bumpy learning and then quite quickly it goes over 60 and then it kind of stays constant at 60. Don't ask me why 
we have rarely a hundred score because it would have been possible <laughs> with the materials they had, but I think it's a mix of some new people coming in and some of this, some of the people being tested probably just being okay with a 75 or whatever they got. They probably thought that was a quite decent score. Good, so here is respiratory infection, malnutrition, and uh, yeah, you know, like now, this just shows that they learned to do the tests. I'm not sure it really shows that they got better in their overall knowledge of IMCI, but they clearly, I would say there's clear evidence that they took the test seriously or learned to take the test seriously and did better over time. And there's like a quite amazing flattening after the first quarter of 2020, pretty much in all vignettes. It's just like a, a thumb plateau and doesn't improve any further. Good, so that's a good start, but kind of easy to gain the system if you are smart. So the question is, does this check, does this change anything in practice? And I think that's where the direct observations come in. So as I said, for all facilities, we had a staff there for like a whole observation staff there for two or three days. And during those days, they observed like under five children, uh, they under five sick child visits um, <clears throat> just by sitting there. I think that part uh, was done very well. Like we had the staff that were, I think two thirds MDs and one third like highly trained nurses. And we really worked with them very carefully to make sure they never interfered. Like they were just sitting there, they were documenting. We had everything pre-coded on the tablet. Did the provider do this? And I think we also tried to not just capture what they asked, but also what the answer was. So for example, there was a question like, did the provider take the temperature? Yes, like if yes, what was the temperature? So we could in the data kind of see what kind of case we were talking about. And I think that worked quite well. So each step was documented. And then we took some summary measures because of course there are lots of uh, diagnostic steps involved. Uh, just in case you wonder what kind of people are here, so as you can see, we have very few MDs because we are at the health center levels and the MDs in uh, DRC mostly you find at the hospitals. Um, we have 58% A1 nurses and 33A2, uh, so A1 would be with a college degree, like it's either three or four years of studying, whereas well, A2 are these um, nursing programs that start in senior secondary. I like guess it's a um, special program that exists in quite a few countries where you enter essentially at grade 11 and you do the last two years of senior secondary essentially in the nursing school and then do an additional, I think one or two years to complete the degree. Uh, the, the patient mix, I think is fairly standard. 60% had a fever, 11% had um, diarrhea, 9% had a cough, and the other had some other reasons uh, why they came in. There's no big difference between treated and control as expected. So what kind of behaviors do we look at? Uh, first, we look at the danger signs. I think you also know them well. So it's just things that kind of flag uh, children that are at a high risk of mortality. So one of them is inability to drink, then did the child vomit? Has the child been displaying lethargic behavior? And uh, has the child experienced convulsions? And according to IMCI guidelines, these questions should pretty much asked all the time. And uh, this graph here is from baseline, and you can see <laughs> that's definitely not the case. There are about 8% who don't ask any, <laughs> and 8% of inspections, and then um, typically they ask about two of the four things, and in about 20% of cases, providers do what they're supposed to do according to the guidelines. Um, we also looked at other essential checks. This was a bit more arbitrary, but we were looking at the guidelines of things that uh, really kind of signal whether you make an effort. So this is taking temperature, measuring respiratory rate, actually undressing the child, like looking at the breathing, looking at the chest, do the skin fold test, checking arms and eyes, feet and ankle and ear and necks. Essentially, did, did you take the time to really take a careful look at the child? And you can see the distribution here. So here the average or like the most common, the, the mode, let's say, is six out of eight tests. But remarkably here, you see some, some child uh, sick visits where almost none of that happened. Sometimes these kids just come in and there's a diagnosis and the child walks back out again, which of course should not happen. Okay, so what do we see on compliance? I think the news here is moderately good, I would say. So we see a non-significant increase in the number of danger signs um, verified. So 
a little bit in the right direction, but not like the overall assessment PCAC score. If we just look at all the steps, um, that's a uh, I put here the standard deviation. That's about the 0.2 standard deviation improvements, number of essential assessments. It's also about like a zero, so again, here actually more like 0.4% improvement. And then we had pre specified, like that, the, as outcome, that the provider does at least six of the essential assessments based on the baseline. And we got like a nine percentage point improvement there. This is borderline significant. So maybe it was a mistake to pre specify that outcome. But I guess it all goes uh, in the same direction. Maybe for next time, we'll focus on the continuous outcome as something where we have a bit more power. Um, in case you wonder what exactly did improve, this is a bit small. I'm not sure how well you can see it on your screen, but I would say the general pattern is they did a bit more of everything. Like if you look at the things that improved more, like by maybe 10 percentage points, it's things like checking respiratory frequency, undressing child, like uh, auscultating, uh, checking, asking about measles, and then there's like some smaller effects. Actually, the only thing that there's a few things that don't change, like breeds the patient asks about diarrhea and tests for malaria, which are really commonly done. So we don't see much traction there. I would say we just see an improvement in overall effort in like tests that are not as routinely done as others in the direct observation. Um, yeah, uh, we also look at where this impact comes from, just kind of stratifying the sample a little bit. And as I mentioned, we saw lots of people uh, starting in the two years after the program had been launched. Um, so roughly here, you see we have a total of 480 observations and 130 of those were staff that started in 2020 or later. So very close to the end line. And there we see no impact. And for those that have been longer, we see a bigger impact. And interesting, we also see a much bigger effect for staff that's over 40, which I think we interpret as evidence that maybe having not, not having been exposed to training recently, maybe benefiting more for, from this thing. But this is, I guess, not specified analysis, just kind of us digging around in the data. So I would not uh, overinterpret this. What do we see in terms of prescriptions? Uh, so ideally, of course, we would have loved to see that now that they do a better job in actually looking at these children, we see differences in diagnosis and then what they get, but we don't see any of that. So in a way it's hard because to really assess whether the final diagnosis was correct, we would have needed to have an expert essentially do an assessment and cross-check cross that. So uh, we don't have that. What we can do is like, okay, let's look at respiratory infection. Let's see if they are given an antibiotic and we see that goes down, but it's not clear whether going down is actually good or bad because for some of them, if it's really pneumonia, they should be given an antibiotic, but if it's just some upper respiratory infection, not so not clear. For malaria, like, yeah, I mean, there, I think like we were hoping that they would be, maybe they should have uh, been more likely to get anti malarial, but once again, they already did it quite a bit at baseline, so not much. To me, where I was hoping we would see a bit more is like referrals to the hospital, because I think one of the main things that we were pushing providers to do is to really identify kids with severe infections. And if they would have done that, they should have referred them to the nearest hospital as the IMCI guidelines recommend, but we unfortunately don't see any of that. And we also don't see that they were more likely to keep them under observation. So in terms of the final kind of prescription or referral decision, there is not much we could observe. Quick quick the, question about the, yeah. sorry, about the referral. Yeah, is that yeah. in any of the vignettes? Like, is that a right answer to like one of the vignettes or how, in, like, how just, closely do these like track to the kinds of vignettes that they were essentially like rehearsing? It was in one of them, like was okay. the recommended action like it was the CV end and result it was, end result okay. was like send them refer them although Got it. I mean I should also add like I'm being a bit maybe I'm being a bit unfair to the providers because we had like when when we discussed with our export expert doctors team in the training mm -hmm. like how to use observations like one of the things that was discussed for a long time was this decision to refer because many of the doctors felt like this IMCI recommendation to refer is completely useless. Like they said like, well, you know, the next hospital is 30 kilometers away over a swamp. Like I would never refer anybody because they will not go in any case. So why bother? So they felt like this 
sometimes is not useful but in the vignettes like we were trying to say okay but like assume that the hospital can be reached and like try to push them a little bit but maybe it's just there in in practice once we actually go out that's not something that is feasible to them i should have put in the mean here like i think the referrals here are incredibly rare like it's maybe three percent or so of kids ever get referred so it's not something that these providers do and maybe also something to think about like if we're really talking about severe illness these primary healthcare centers are probably not in a good place to treat them, but they're also not willing to refer. And then of course the outcome might not be as good as we were, would hope for, but I'd, clearly that would require a stronger intervention to motivate and to refer, or maybe more support for referrals. I don't know what would be needed here. Good, so we also looked at the household level. I think that was more speculative. Like if, if parents would be super convinced that the care is much better, maybe they would have sought more care, but I think I was never too optimistic we would find something there, but there is nothing as you can see uh, in this slide. But then of course, ultimately we would want to see child survival to Im improving. I mean, maybe given the weak results so far, <laughs> you are also not convinced we should see child survival improvement. And I, yeah, this is the, the toughest part and maybe we should also discuss. So we have quite a few kids in the sample so we, uh, recruited at N9 uh, women who had given birth in the last two years, were sorry, were pregnant or had given birth in the last two years. And it seemed like a very reasonable thing to recruit by because we had all these questions on antenatal care. But actually, it resulted in kind of like a funny sample that I hadn't anticipated. So, because if you had, if you were pregnant in 2020 or 2021, very likely you were not pregnant in 2019. So, we have very few 2019 kids. And we also have a really weird spike in mortality from the 2017 kids, which I interpret as evidence like, well, maybe if the woman had a birth and if the, that child died, there's a higher chance that she was pregnant again in our recruitment window. I don't know where this comes from, but this is our current speculative interpretation. Like we have this really weird spike. I mean, it doesn't affect any of our estimates because it's the same in treated and control areas, but it's a the sample has some weird properties that we hadn't anticipated this like this essentially low number of births in 2017 and the relatively high mortality among those births that uh, we have in our sample anyway in total we have 8200 live births that were reported by the moms and all of these moms were moms with recent birth like the oldest birth recorded was from 1982 there are very few before 2000 and there are 320 deaths, out of which 240 are in the first year of life. I think that's very consistent with national estimates. If you look at the estimated mortality rate in our sample, we are below the 70 that I gave you in the beginning. And I think there is definitely some underreporting, um, probably of deceased children or of just death overall. We're not quite sure, but I think it should also not affect us too much because, once again, we are just comparing the relative risk in our two groups. This so is their already... like total risk of um, yeah. mortality yeah. up until age five. Yeah, it's actually not. Yeah, it's not that as clean. My uh, will probably scold me for not having a clean demographic measure here. This is just like probability of death by the time of the survey, so kind of DHS style. Okay. So when we came, like, is the child still alive in 2022? Essentially, is this? Could this be Ebola? Like. Um... 17, I don't Well, with I mean, a year being 17 and maybe the mortality happening like later. I, I, that's I don't a good know. question I, I will ask. I, I doubt it because Ebola yeah. wasn't much in that region. Like Bandundu was not heavily affected, right. but maybe there was yeah. some under reporting. And in general, the number of deaths was just not that high, I think in 2017. But let me check. I think it's a good question. Would be a cooler story than our sample selection story. <laughs> Great, so how how would mortality impact? Uh, so here I'll start with the noisy estimates of the annual mortality difference just between treated and control. And you could say it's kind of all over the place, but if you're good at eyeball electrometrics, uh, you can see that like in the pre-period, essentially the treated uh, areas had an average like higher mortality and in the post-period it's slightly lower, right? So if you, run a regression and let you guess what you will find. <laughs> and well, maybe I'll let you stare just for five seconds at these trends. 
So essentially, if you just look at the pre-period, you see that these guys have higher mortality. If you look at the post-period, it's slightly lower or the same. So if you estimate the standard difference and differences, you get some significant improvements. But if you split them, that goes away. So here is how this looks in practice. So in the pre-period, so if I just pool all the years before the intervention, before 2018, you can see that the, an average in the treated facilities for some reason, and I really don't know why, we have like about 20 per thousand deaths more, like a mortality rate of 20 per thousand higher, which is a lot. In the post period, it's slightly lower, but then of course, if you would estimate like a very naive difference in difference model, like looking at the change difference in difference around 2018, you get a quite significant catching up essentially of the control areas. And then if you trim that to post 2010, because we have this problem that there's like this huge difference it's very early in the sample, it gets smaller and then even smaller if you trim post 2015 still, like this would still be 16 deaths per thousand or 10 deaths per thousand, not small, but yeah, uh, not overwhelming either. <laughs> so I put here a note, like I'm not quite sure, like I, I discussed this a lot with Gil and I think our short summary would be there's maybe some signals that it may have helped, but it's very hard to interpret this and we definitely don't want to push this too much. Great. With that, I think I'm close to the end already. So let me just try to briefly summarize and then hopefully we have some questions to discuss. <laughs> so I think what the study shows is that you can use these incentivized knowledge assessments to improve provider knowledge uh, of some of these protocols, at least to the extent that these are captured in our vignettes. And I think the study also suggests that you can find also some improvements in clinical practice, which to me is like the most positive result of the paper. It's not a huge effect. Like I think it's not that they suddenly did all the four danger signs and did all the checks they should have done, but I think it's, yeah, order of magnitude, maybe a third of a standard deviation, which I think is quite meaningful. Uh, given that this program within, within the larger program was really not expensive to run. I'll say more about it in a second. Surprisingly to me, providers seemed quite happy with the program. I thought they would be a bit annoyed by us coming and telling them how to do their job, but they seemed to be quite open to these tests and they seemed to have appreciated the feedback. The health effects are very noisy. I, I'm not, yeah, I'm not convinced. This is like a real improvement. I think one idea that we are having is that there's a new DHS uh, that is run in 2022 and these programs are still operational so we could try to have a slightly larger data set there or at least an external data set do some spatial matching and see if we can at least verify some of those signals but I, I'm not sure how much we'll get from that and then of course what's also not clear is how cost effective is this program I think within the setting that we were working in like with this like large PBF program that already has a contract with the facility that has a quarterly visit already that does the quality checks. The marginal cost of adding the vignette is, of course, almost zero. Like all we had to do is develop the vignettes in the beginning, and then just whoever goes there runs and scores the vignette with a local provider. And I think, yeah, uh, compared to the big program, which was, um, yeah, in the millions, I think, yeah, of uh, cost, like this is really tiny that uh, could be done. Like on the other hand, if you would run this program as standalone, that would look very different. Like if you had to go out to any of, like to all of these facilities every quarter, randomly select a provider, like do this test slash game slash assessment with them. I, I don't think that would be the most effective way to do that. But I guess that just means it depends on the context and on the degree to which these facilities are being contacted on a regular basis in any case. I think that's something to think about in the future. I will end here. I think you all know how to reach me. So thank you for listening and thanks in advance for some questions. Awesome, this is great, super interesting and so nice to have you back here. So um, I will facilitate um, questions um but you know while we're sort of aggregating questions I'll, <laughs> I'll ask one <laughs> um so how, uh, maybe you can reflect a little bit on sort of what you think about this sort of 
maybe slight signal that the providers like seem to like this system better than the sort of default where they're just using the standard quality tools. Um, you know, is that because it's kind of easy to figure out and score well on or or do you think it has some, something more like more substantive meaning around them feeling like they want like more guidance and training? I'm, I'm curious about what you're if you have any like anything um, yeah, I, on that. It's a great question. Like, I don't know. Like, we only have like we didn't do much qualitative work at Enline, partially also because we would have been hard to have a representative sample, but we have quite a few questions that were open-ended in the endline form, like what did you like? Like how did you feel about this vignette? And I think my general sense from those responses, and they are just kind of like one sentence responses, is that they thought it was a useful way of training. Like, you know, somebody came, they talked to us, and it was a good way to learn, and they didn't seem to be stressed at all about the financial implications. Actually, there was also like one question, like, did you ever get personally punished because you did bad on a test? And I think nobody said yes to that. So I think somehow, I don't think the facility pushed too much on that. And maybe, yeah, maybe the structure is also not quite clear. Like one thing that's never quite clear to me with these programs is that is the actual understanding of this contract, like the, you know, just just the structure, like just the quantitative bonus itself is already like 37 indicators. And then you multiply that with the qualitative score, which is like over a hundred checks on the checklist. Like that's really from, is the toilet clean? Is there soap? Like, is there like the price, like is there the price list at the entrance? Like, uh, did you fill the logs? Like this is like a long, long list. So I am not really sure like the, the whoever is in charge of the facility fully understands like, any of these components and maybe that's also the reason why the financial whip so to say like didn't didn't really hurt them like i think all the mm -hmm. feedback i read was really more about the um, you know sitting down and talking about this and having these vignettes in in the office mm -hmm. and you chat about them and you get feedback mm -hmm. and they thought that was nice kind of and i i i think that's my interpretation mm. okay i see kevin and then sebastian with their hands up go ahead Great, thanks. Uh, great to see you, Gunther, and, and super, super interesting work. Um, I was wondering if you could say something, it may have been sort of implicitly in there at, at some point, but I was just wondering, you, know, you presented the sort of take up and most of the facilities, you know, sort of, and sometimes get the program, but then only about a third of health workers have actually been directly exposed. But then you have these, had these big effects. And does that, I guess, like, does that imply that among those third that really were exposed, the effects were enormous and they just like really love this program? Or do you do you have some spillover, do you think? Is there any way you can um, tease that out in the data? Do you um, do you have sort of some intuition of that? Or or because I mean the the idea that care overall is is getting better, um, I guess, you know, it it seems um it, it seems hard to think about these bigger population level effects if it's just a really small fraction of people that are learning something. But I think it's just more interesting generally for, for the broader quality um, sort of research agenda if there is this diffusion. Thanks. Yeah, no, no, that's a great question. Like we looked a little bit at it, like I had just one quick slide on stratified results. And I think it kind of goes in the direction that you suggested that there is definitely evidence for those that have been around and those we can kind of match. And the matching is a pain as, as you can imagine because you have to match by name and who was there and who was not. So we only match about a third, but you definitely see like much bigger effects among those that like we know were assessed and you see much weaker effects among those who came halfway through the program and like those who are not there very often and those who just come out of training. So you kind of see where the effects come from um, and it goes the way you would expect. But I would also argue that even if you were not directly exposed, it's quite likely that you know, your colleagues talk about it, like there is like probably the monthly staff meeting and like there's some discussion. And even if you don't know who was assessed and even if you were not assessed, like probably there's at least somebody from a bank coming through now and then talking about this. So I think there's these spillovers that are there. I'm not sure how large they are. And I don't think we can really quantify them because we don't have enough detail. But I think what we should do is for the direct observation, maybe tease out more carefully about like show those measures also directly by, is it more important that you were directly tested or is it more important that you have been at the facility for two years? Because that would give you also some 
ground, like at, at least some idea of the relative importance of being in a system where this thing exists versus being exposed to yourself, right? Like if, if we find stronger effects for being there for two years but never have been tested, then for being tested yourself, that would suggest it's more about this systematic conversation and like spillovers. And if it's the other way around, it's more about you getting stressed and actually picking up that manual and starting to study. Cool. Go ahead, Sebastian. Thanks, uh, thanks, Gunter. Thanks, good to see you and good to see all of you. Um, I, I guess just one observation, you know, from, from the work on, on PBF, I think this vignette stuff is really the the bleeding edge of PBF design. And it's sort of the fourth generation or something, I'm not quite sure. And I, I just wondered what your general thought on using that sort of not just for sort of um, research purposes, but at, at scale for policy is. And uh, you mentioned already a couple of observations, but just one maybe additional one. I, I, if I understood correctly, there's sort of one random worker per facility. Um, that seems very risky for facility that you know, they might accidentally get the bad apple who does the completes the vignette. Yeah. And then on top of that, I guess, for any given worker, the performance on the vignette is also to some degree, at least uncertain, because you might have a good day, bad day, might be vignette that you can handle very well or not. And the 50% of your bonus, which then is 40% or something of the facility budget hangs on it. That seems like a very risky proposition. So I just sort of curious what you think in addition to the, the level bonus, I guess there's sort of this, the risk piece to it of how much the facility actually gets paid and and what your thoughts are on that? Thanks. Yeah, no, those are lots of great questions. I, I, let me try like the, start with the first one about scalability and like this being like the hot thing right now. Like I have mixed feelings. Like I think if you have like an ongoing PBF arrangement, which I'm also not sure is the best way to run like a health system, but let's say you have that, I think adding a component that focuses on provider training and feedback, I think is a good idea. Like I think if you already send somebody there all the time, use that for sharing information, like for some quizzing, testing, whatever, mentoring, I think that seems like an efficient way of running this. But if you start this from scratch, I am not sure. Like on, on the risk, I think the bank was quite conscious of that. And I think that's also why they didn't make the incentive too powerful, right? Like I think this was for the health centers, the maximum one was 25 and like the risk really only kicked in if you got a score of less than 50 in the weighted average of the structure where 50 was really quite easy to get and the vignette. So they set it in an app in a way that I think, yeah, I looked it up yesterday. I think like only 5% or so facilities, facility periods ever fell below the threshold. So I think it's, not that high of a risk and then also bear in mind that like if you're just at the cutoff so like say you would get two thousand um would be the payment like you would get the 50 percent score you would get a bonus of 250 so you lose 250 so the maximum loss is 10 percent if you just fall below right and i think that's manageable i would say in, in terms of the bigger picture and i think that was intentional i think your point i think was where like i think was an important one because you wouldn't want to jeopardize like 80% of that quarterly payment because that could really ruin the facilities. I think finding the balance between like an incentive that you can feel but doesn't hurt you too much if things go wrong is important. I think they did a pretty good job here. I'm still not sure about this from 50 to nothing, but maybe that was just a way of signaling you should care and like at least get a decent score on this. And then whether you are good or perfect, I don't care about. But I was not part of the discussion. But I think that the discussion about making the incentive not too powerful, I think, was there, and I think they tried to accommodate your concerns, like by not by not making it too big. Um, I see that Margaret has a question, also. <laughs> hey, uh, Gunther, great to see you uh, along with everybody else. A um, couple of thoughts. One is the I was thinking a lot about the um, the theory of change here, like what's actually the mechanism, and I, that's already come up in a number of questions. So I won't belabor it because I think that that would be important to sort of elucidate. What are we getting at? I'm struck by the fact that in the US, there's a robust industry and a much less robust literature about the use of clinical vignettes as a training tool, as an ongoing uh, continuing education tool. There's a number of startups that apparently are doing very well, pushing vignettes out, computerized phone vignettes and so on to to clinicians and um, and testing, yeah, impacts on practice. So, but that's a 
that's a very intensive program, you know, and, and folks could do that as part of their continuing education credits and so on. But just to say it's well integrated here, this notion of being faced with a, with a, a decision making sort of algorithm, right, as, as a better way to learn than simply recounting, uh, you know, or reading a book. So that's, I think that's really cool that the bank's looking into these more, uh, more interactive pieces. But I think, again, TBD in terms of what's the level of improvement one can expect from that, especially with a low dose. That's what was a lot in my mind. What's really the dose of this intervention in the in the population? And then two quick reflections and maybe questions for you. You uh, you asked about or you, you mentioned this, um, you know, the the the, the DAD um, effect sizes were quite different and, and significance was quite different depending on where you made the cuts. I would argue, agree with you that it's probably more plausible to look at those later um, dates or those later cutoffs if for another reason, which is just the epidemiology of mortality in the time frame has changed so much. Some of these things will not be as amenable to these kinds of vignettes. I just think that it's really so incomparable. We see this in our research, right? The, the things that were killing babies and things that are killing babies now are really, really different. So I think it would just be more robust and probably more plausible to look at the narrower time time period, even though of course you lose a lot of sample. And then a last thing is just a question to you, an observation from my own work, but also a question to you and others. You know, I feel like in some ways I've come in my research to the kind of the the uh, uh, end of the productivity of the clinical observation as a as a measure of quality. Um, for many of the reasons you've said, Gunther, uh, but the big one being just to reiterate that we don't know whether they did the right thing, right? Even if you have a nurse standing in the corner, all we can um, uh, you know, sort of tag is the number of items. And if I think to my own practice, way in the day, you know, lots of uh, clinical items can get done by someone who makes goes on to make the wrong diagnosis and prescribe the wrong treatment. Um, so I guess I wondered whether you'd considered whether in any of the bank projects, uh, um, there's another methodology that could be used, which is clinical re-exam. You alluded to this. So rather than observing, or maybe in addition, at least as a test case, you know, having a clinician reassess the child and see, yeah, I would have made the same diagnosis. I would have made, uh, you know, I would have assigned this kind of treatment. I would have assigned these diagnostic tests um, as as an as an alternative and, and possibly better um, approach to measuring a quality of the visit. What do you think? Yeah, so some really great points. So let me start with the easy one. So. Great to know about the US. I'm not familiar with the literature, but I look it up and I think it will actually help with the paper just to frame it that these are models that are run and maybe I'll come back to you to ask for references. As for the mortality, I agree. Like I, yeah, I think we have to show the mortality results. Like I'm neither proud nor fond of them. Like I think it's just like a, yeah, very noisy. And yeah, I think like to me, the best model would be just the project period, like look at 2015, 2022, and then I think, okay, it's insignificant. It's just like statistically speaking, okay, like we're just fitting a pre-trend. So why throw out some of the data? Like how how do you draw that line? And I, I in the end, probably since this will go to the econ drone, we just sort of show like a million specifications and then bore everyone to death. <laughs> I think that's that's what's gonna happen. And um then on this direct observation, that's a great point. Like um, in, in my defense, when we launched this project, I was pushing hard for having a medical, like having a provider reassess these. And it was rejected for, I'm not sure political reasons, but I think because the bank was worried about too much controversy. They would say like, okay, well, especially in the hospitals, we're gonna send in somebody from the Central Ministry of Health and they're gonna reassess and then the provider is gonna be bad and they're gonna start arguing and we don't want that. Like we want this to go smooth. And it's, hence all the instructions, like our guys had to be like quiet and they don't intervene and like you never change the diagnosis. And I think, it, yeah, I'm still sad we didn't, we didn't get through with it because I think it would have been better. Like I think just have somebody who sits down and says like, okay, this, I think, with a full examination to the best of my knowledge is the correct diagnosis, acknowledging that that might also be imperfect. I mean, nobody does the perfect diagnosis all the time, but I think it would have given us an objective benchmark. What, what we did, though, and I think you have seen those with Emma, is to try to improve the tool that the bank has, you know, that we didn't just ask about, like, did you do A, B, C, and D, but actually when you did, like, what was there, like, what was the anemia level, what was the temperature, what was the weight, so we have quite a bit more data than the usual projects. 
But even with that, as I'm sure you're guessing, it's almost impossible to classify, right? Like even if the, if I know the respiratory rate was like 50 and I know the weight and I know the exact age and I know the temperature, I can only guess, right? Like what yeah. kind of, like even if I know, okay, there was some sounds in the breathing, like I can better guess what the diagnosis was, but it's very hard to still say that with confidence. And I think that's the main challenge. And then of course, that's the best case in, in the worst case, of course, and the more common case, the provider didn't check half of the things. And then of course, all these fields are empty, right? If I have a provider who neither undressed the child nor took the time to measure the temperature, our data file is empty. So then I cannot do anything despite mm -hmm. the cool tool. But yeah, that's a bigger debate. And I think for obvious reasons, it's not done very often. It's expensive and it has a potential for controversy, but I am with you. I think for these kind of projects, I would trust it much more than just having the person sit there. And also if you think, like if I think about my project, it's kind of sad because we had essentially the doctors sit there and observe and check like a silly tablet in the same exact time they could have been sitting outside that office and have done the reassessment and we would have had much better data. My clinical blood pressure is rising as I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I know that Richard, so we, we have to wrap up. Um, I know that Richard has a question. So, you know, if, if, uh, you know, if you want to quickly ask your question and then, um, you know, people could can go. But before, you know, I, I want to just thank Gunther again and everyone else for coming and for the really interesting discussion. And if, Richard, if you have a last comment or question, go for it. But um, we'll let people go and, and just, you know, our sincere thanks and, you know, look forward to seeing where this project goes. But go ahead, Richard. Yeah, uh, you alluded early on to the very high turnover rate. Uh, and I understand that in terms of a study that makes it difficult, but the whole system has high turnover rates. How do you factor that in to the ultimate intervention that you want to do? Yeah, it's tough. I honestly, like I underestimated it, I must confess. Like I, I knew that there was turnover, but not like 50% turnover over two years, which we often observe. And I think that DRC in a way is a bit of the wild west i think many of these facilities have almost no core funding like they run like day-to-day -day business and they have these providers who come and work for a while and they mostly get like the out-of-pocket expenditure as their income like they're most of them are not salaried like they, they come they work they're employed they get some money as it comes in and i think that of course in a way for results-based financing is great a, a great place to work because i think these guys we really need the money and they will come and they will adjust to the money. But for a training program, of course, it's very hard. Like if you have staff shifting from one facility to the other, it's hard. Like we, we try to see how many of, of the providers we had that the baseline reappeared in another facility at Endline and that's very small. So in terms of spillovers, I'm not concerned, but in terms of effects that last, I think it's a problem. Like if you explain something to a group and then three months later, you have a whole different group it's kind of hard to, to have persistent effects on quality of care. Fine. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Nice to see you. Okay. Well. All right. Thank you so much. This is terrific and nice to see everyone. And we'll hopefully see you very soon. Good thing. Exactly. So thanks Next for time in being person. here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Next year in person for sure. Or we will we'll all go over there and visit you. Thanks, everyone. That's great. <laughs> Thank you all. Thanks for organizing. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.